over there, huh? <laughs> that was funny. Go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Hebrews chapter 11, we'll be starting at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Father, once again, we just pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding, Lord, that we would do all of your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. We've been looking at in detail those who have held fast to their faith. Even though the Bible makes no monuments to failures, there are sad stories of warning for those who have slipped away. You know who they are. I mean, just think of the people that you know, the people maybe you sat with in church, the people maybe you've recognized as leaders or at least thought they were leaders. Some people you may have prayed with and they were a strength to you. Maybe people that you served with and they were an encouragement to you or worshipped with them and they were just simply a blessing to you, but no longer are they here, no longer. It's not so much that they're not at this church, they're not at any church. They stopped holding fast to faith, and they slipped away. In Psalm 55, verses 12 through 14, King David speaks of such a situation. It says, For it is not an enemy who reproaches me, then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me, who has exalted himself against me, then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walk to the house of God in the throng. That's the hardest part of ministry. The biggest blessing in ministry is the people. The hardest part in ministry is the people. And especially the ones that break your heart that are no longer walking with the Lord. The ones who are no longer here. I remember when we started the church, there was this grand excitement. But there was quite a few people that slipped away since that time. And again, it's not so much that they went to another church, it's that they stopped going to church. I always look at that personally as a failure on my part as the pastor, but we all are accountable before God. We're all accountable that we would hold fast to our faith. At some point, somebody can seem so right on, and we have to check our heart, but at other times, you can go so far out, and we need to make sure that that does not apply to us. Apostle John referred to this phenomenon, 1 John 2.19. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. The idea is, is to dig in. Dig in in the face of opposition. Dig in when things are going on contrary to your opinion. Not the word of God, but your opinion. To dig in when things get hard and things get tough. I was doing the devotion for the children's ministers about an hour ago. And we were looking at Exodus chapter 14, and here's the children of Israel. They're released from Egyptian captivity. Now keep in mind, this is God leading them, and the first thing he does is lead them before the Red Sea. And so they're in a, between a rock and a hard spot, if you will. There's the Red Sea in their mind. We can't pass that. There's a mountain range. Well, that's, we can't go past that. And they look behind them, and here comes the Egyptian army. And they're thinking, why has God brought us out to this place to kill us? Well, God's teaching them to trust on him. And we know the story. They split the sea, the people go through, and the Egyptians drown in the sea. 
But right after that, we looked at, uh, at chapter 15, and now all of a sudden they're out in the wilderness. And there's two million, we're told two million men, there's probably close to two million women, and probably even more than that in children, so quite a few people. And now they're looking for water, and there's no water to be found, and once again, they start complaining. And, and we see that, how, how that works, maybe even in our own lives, as things aren't going how we think they should be going. And God basically is teaching them that even though, well, just as I worked a miracle right out of the gate with those plagues to release you from the world, just as I worked a miracle to get you out into the wilderness for the purpose of leading you into the promised land, I'm going to provide for you. Maybe not as you desire, but just as you need. And the lesson extends to us because on the day of your salvation, God worked an absolute miracle in your life. There's no denying that, and you must recognize that. You must recognize that that was from the hand of God. God did not save you to destroy you, quite the contrary. God saved you because God loves you and desires you. Things are going to be pretty tough at times, because keep in mind, God led them to their trials for the purpose of growth, maturity, and understanding. And God's going to do the same thing with you. And we can be just like the children of Israel, whining and complaining at the foot of every trial. And Lord, how could you do this? I'm going to be the very first person that God left and forsook. And God doesn't do that. God trains us up. God exercises our faith for the purpose of strength and continuance. This is, again, God doing a work and showing us this picture of those who were previous to us in order to strengthen our faith, that we would see the example that was set for us. So faith, faith comes and is strengthened by the word of God, from those who have gone before us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the apostle Paul told the young pastor Timothy, be diligent, put effort into this. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, of course, because that builds faith. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, then you've got weak faith, and it is something, as we see here, looking at it from the opposite, that you should be ashamed of in the sight of God. So those who seem to be saints, well, the Bible, unfortunately, is filled with them. They seem to be saints. They seem to be strong. But after a period of time, they also slipped away. Look at the devil. At some point, the Bible tells us the devil was the worship leader in heaven. But he desired, he desired to be God. Pride entered in, and great was his fall. He slipped away. Adam and Eve, they wanted to know what God knows, and they slipped away from the position that they had with God. King Saul wanted to do things his own way. Judas, he wanted to make things happen, and Demas wandered back to the ways of the world. All these people who at one time seemed so strong, seemed so right on, and they just slipped away. You have to examine your heart. You have to look at your walk. You have to know, regardless of who you are, regardless of how strong you are today, we have to constantly be re-evaluating our walks. I don't want you to be evaluating other people's walks because that's not your business here. Your business here is your walk before a holy God. And you need to make sure that you're holding strong because we live in times when our faith is under attack. How is our faith under attack? It's under attack by the word of God being under attack. There are strong men. I just read about one. Was it this morning or last night? It was this morning. A, a well-known man, used to be on K-Wave Radio, he's denied the inerrancy of the Word of God. And, and you see these people, as they're slipping away, I wonder, who, who are they leading away as well? Let not many of you become teachers, because you'll be held to a higher degree of accountability. In Proverbs 14, 14, it says, the backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. It's whatever sounds good to them. That's what Israel, their own ways, their own ideas. We're in a hopeless situation. Nothing can save us now. Boom, God enters in. It's not about my ways. It's all about submitting myself to the way of the Lord. Why spend so much time and detail in this chapter? So that you would consider yourself if you're holding fast to faith or you're slipping away. Remember, if you're staying static, 
If you're just in the same place you were last year or the year before, that's in the category of slipping away. We are to grow in our Christian lives through our Christian walks. And so for the purpose of understanding the writer of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 2, he says, For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. Now we're going step by step through the people that are listed here to see what their strengths in faith were that God used and God blessed and how they relate to our lives. So far, we've seen Abel. He stayed strong in his faith in that he worshiped God as God desires to be worshiped. Secondly was Enoch. He was a man who stayed strong in his faith because he walked with God. He lived his life according to God's will, according to God's standards. Noah, he stayed strong in faith in that he built without understanding. God told him to build an ark because it's going to rain and a flood's coming. Probably didn't know what an ark was, definitely didn't know what rain was. It had yet to rain on the earth and more than likely didn't know what a flood was. But the only thing he knew is, is that God said to build and so he built. Abraham, he stayed strong in his faith because when God told him to go, he went. He went. He didn't really know where he was going. He didn't know what the end result was going to be. But the thing that he knew is, is this what God had told him to do, and he moved forward. Now, keep in mind, he was formerly an idolater. He didn't understand. He didn't have the Bible as we have the Bible today. How much more so do we have a responsibility before a holy God to act when God says to act, when move when God says to move? When preaching his sermon before an angry mob, the first martyr that we have in the New Testament, his name is Stephen, he started at the faith of Abraham. We see this in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 5. He looked at this man and saw the great faith that this man exhibited. In Abraham's travel of obedience that we see, well, we see this complete package of faith and all that faith is able to do for a person as the Apostle Paul used him as an example. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, he says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted for him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So he's basically saying, Abraham set this example. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. The faith that we exhibit today is based upon the faith, the example of faith that Abraham exhibited so long ago. God said to go, Abraham went. At some point to you, God said, come into the Christian life. And those of you who are born again, you moved in obedience and you came into the Christian faith. And that's why he's saying that we're sons of Abraham and that we moved as Abraham moved. I didn't know what was before me. I remember the day that I made an altar call. That as I came forward, I didn't know what I was getting into. I was concerned about that. I was a little bit nervous. I was even scared. Because I didn't just want to jump into something halfway, but I didn't know if I wanted to jump into this all the way. But God blessed every step of the way. So it's in Abraham first that we see a journey of faith. Once again, verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he's going. It's been said that a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. The problem is that first step can be so hard. And because of that, first steps are so rare. First steps, I mean, so many people, they, 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 I hear what they want to do. People have come up to me and told me what God has called them to do, and they never take the first step. And I'm just thinking... Ought you not to have a fear of God that would motivate you? Since you came to me, you even said, God said. Keep in mind, that's taking the name of the Lord in vain. To say that God said and not really believe that God said or follow through in obedience to what you believe God has said, it's taking the name of the Lord in vain. They're rare because so many people talk about what God wants, so few people do what God wants. God will direct your steps, but you got to take the steps. You must take that first step. But as for those who take that first step, what is it that motivated them, that made them move? It was the desired destination of that last step. I was talking to one of the guys 
before service out front. It was quite a few years ago. We were going on a hike to San Gregonio. And I can remember when we arrived at the trailhead. San Gregonio is one of the highest peaks in Southern California. We arrived at the trailhead. We knew it was going to be 10 miles up to the peak, and then it was going to be 10 miles back. We were doing this all in one day because we were stupid. <laughs> I don't remember the elevation, but it was, I don't know, 5,000, 4,000 feet that we were climbing up, something like that. And, uh, and there was a light powder of snow on the ground. And we said, let's go. Why? Because we wanted to get to the destination. The destination was our motivation. And so we took off. And we're going and going and you're tired, and, but you keep going because you want to get to that goal. You want to get to that prize. And we get almost all the way up and it's starting to snow. And, but we keep going, and the wind is starting to blow, and we go through these clouds, and we kind of come up on top, and we're above the clouds, and it's cold, and it's windy up there. And the guy who was kind of the leader says, we've got to turn around and go back because it's snowing, and we're going to lose the trail. And so we're marching through the snow and the whole thing. But when we were up there, we have a picture of it, we made it. We made it. It was about 20 degrees. But nonetheless, we made it. And there, there's just that destination to achieve that goal for you, the destination of this Bible study was worth getting out of bed this morning because you wanted to be here. You'll take that first step out of Monday, you know, Monday morning for your job because you know on Friday you'll get the desired destination of a paycheck. I was looking at a picture of my or a little video that was posted on Snapchat. Got all these things nowadays because of grandkids. And little Chris Mike, my youngest of my grandchildren, seventh grandchild, he just turned a year old. He's crawling, but now he's struggling, but he's struggling the good struggle because he wants to walk. And he's got one of those push things, and he walks, and he'll kind of take a couple steps and fall down. But he's willing to do that because he wants to get to that next destination. So a key mark of Abraham's life is that he obeyed when he was called to go out. Now, where was out? We're told, I don't have a clue. But I can tell you exactly where it was. It's anywhere that is outside of your comfort zone. I mean, God's going to call you to the place more than likely that you don't necessarily want to be, that you wouldn't naturally gravitate towards. Maybe it'd even be something that you would normally avoid. But it's that place that God has called us to that, well, that's when true obedience and faith is seen. If you said, Pastor Mike, in obedience and faith after service, I want you to go and kiss Mrs. Pastor Mike. I wouldn't have that. That's not much of an act of faith or a step of obedience because I like kissing Mrs. Pastor Mike. I didn't say Mr. For those of you who may not know, I'm Pastor Mike, and Mrs. Pastor Mike is the woman who was up here, just so we got that square. That's not much of an act of faith. That's not much of an act of obedience. It's when we're called to do the hard things or just the things that we don't understand. Fastly held faith, at least the fastly held faith of Abraham, is best seen in his immediate obedience to God. We even see this, it's not on the screen, but in Genesis chapter 22, when God tells him to take his son, his only son, the son whom he loves, Isaac, and go and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. What does he do the next day, early in the morning? He gets up to go because that was his standard practice. And so God told him to go into this new land. He got up and went. And because he had established that mark of obedience, whatever it was that God had called him to do, wasn't a perfect man, as we'll see, but nonetheless, he moved forward in what God had commanded of him. If the first step isn't taken in a timely manner, then it deadens the call in your life. There was a man, Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary to China that God used in an amazing way. When he recognized the call in his life to go to China, he sold all of his stuff. He started living in poverty. And the reason he was living in poverty, he was in England at the time, the reason he was living in poverty because he was practicing. He was practicing living in poverty because he knew that that's how he would be living in China. He knew what God had called him to do, he took the step of faith, and he took the step of faith immediately. When we compare our callings to Abraham's callings, look at the advantage that we have. Again, Abraham, he was an idolater, and he was living basically a pagan life. You're being called out from within the church that offers you the continuous flow of the Word of God. 
when we have the Word of God, now we learned this on Thursday night, when through the Word of God, you understand God and you know God. And so our acts of faith ought not to be that great, although they still are. We're called to not be conformed to the world, but we are called to be transformed through the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. Conformity, it just sits and stays. Those who are transformed, they break free and they go. Break free from what? Break free from the constraints of our own will and submitting ourselves to the will of God. Do we have to leave and obey? Yeah, you do. I'm not telling you to leave from this church or this city or even your house, but you do have to leave from your chair, from your cocoon, or maybe even your comfort zone. You need to leave and serve. You need to leave and share. You need to leave and support. You need to, again, step outside of yourself. There's not a church, a true biblical church, that is in this land that ought to be having needs in their bulletin. Because people should have a heart to see, to hear the call of God, and to obey. Next, we see in Abraham the endurance of faith, verses 9 through 10. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. There was a friend of mine who went out and planted a church in probably about five, six years later, I was at a conference with him and somebody was talking about faith and going out and doing this and faith and going out and doing that. And he said something that was very profound. He never, he didn't follow through on this in his life and his ministry, but it made perfect sense what he said. He said, you know, there were people were talking about going here and going. He says, the faith isn't always in just the going. The faith is in the staying. The faith is in the digging in. And the faith is in the, the, the moving forward in God and, again, holding fast to faith because those who have slipped away, maybe they did take the first step of faith, but they never followed through in their faith before a holy God. I, somebody was saying something about, I, I don't really remember, sorry about something, whatever, and, and I just told them, hey, you're still here. That speaks volumes to me. People that are still here, people that are still involved, I was looking at a particular person today and reminded that person was here. We have a video of the very first service that we ever had, not of the service, but somebody was just walking around, and and they showed video of the hospitality. And that person, on the very first day, almost 20 years ago, was doing hospitality. That same person was doing hospitality this morning. And I'm just thinking, my goodness, I, I, I pray, Lord, that I would have that faith just to can dig in, to know what God has called me to do, and just keep doing it until he either calls me home or tells me to stop doing it. Abraham didn't just journey over the hill and find heaven. It was a long wait of endurance for him. It was tense and travel. They were nomads to nowhere if you're just looking at them in the flesh. There was a story of a missionary couple, I've mentioned it before, but they slaved in Africa, and they didn't really have what you would call a successful ministry. There was no huge revival, but they just diligently preached the Word of God. This was during the term of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. They finally came time to retire, and they were exhausted, and they were coming home. The church that had sent them out had called them, it's time to come home. And so they got on the ship and they sailed and they were coming into New York Harbor and there was a band and there were crowds and there were streamers and the man was just so excited and thinking this is just great just to finally be recognized. And so they pull up to the dock and they're told just to hold off and just to wait. And he looked over and Teddy Roosevelt got off the boat. He went to one of his safaris and they greeted him. And and then when Teddy Roosevelt left, everybody else did. And the man just shook his head and said, after all we've done, after all we've done for the Lord and we come home and there's not even anybody here to greet us. And his wife says, you're mistaken. This isn't home. It's not home. We continue to endure and endure to the end, to be found faithful in all that God wants us to do because at times this life is going to seem barren. At, this time, at, this, at times this life is going to even seem that it, it rejects us, but we're not home. And I guarantee you, when you get home, part of the reason that you'll know that you're home, because you'll be greeted by the Lord Jesus Christ and all of the saints and angels of heaven. 
and it's going to just be such a glorious time. See, the places that God sends us to are promised, but they're not necessarily to be possessed. One day, you're going to read in the newspaper, or you'll come on Sunday morning, and somebody else is going to be standing here, and that Pastor Mike's going to be with the Lord. I can't possess anything here on, on earth. And some of us were so wanting to possess and we're holding on to whatever it is, the things of the world or the things of our life that we can consider so important. Just seek after the promises of God because you have a great promise of God that is in store for you. He wants you to dwell in particular locations, but it's all looking forward to that permanent place. Again, verse 10, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What was the only plot of possession that Abraham owned? It's seen in Genesis chapter 23 and 25. It's the place where he and his wife were buried. That's the only, I was thinking about that. That's the only place of land that I'm ever really going to permanently as much, or as, I guess as long as the earth is, is around, that I'm permanently going to occupy, at least this body is. Because I say that I own my home. I don't really own the home. The mortgage company owns the home. But I'll have it paid off, and then I'll probably tell people I really do own the home, but I don't really own the home. I'm just a soldier here. I'm just here temporarily, and I just have temporary possession of that house. My heirs are going to get it, and I don't know if they're going to live there or sell it to a complete stranger or what. But the one thing that I'm going to have permanent possession of, I guess, is the plot that I have, the burial plot. Either that, they may dig me up and throw me out too, so I guess that's not even all that permanent. But the permanent possession that I have is that place where Jesus Christ has gone to prepare for me. So what did Abraham do? He did the same thing that we must do. He waited. Waiting was the earmark of his life. Waiting is something so hard. I'm not a patient person, and it's really hard for me to wait. But Abraham, he waited 24 years for his son. He had got the promise. Remember, we looked at it last week. First, his name was Abram, father of many. And then God changed it to Abraham, father of many nations. But he still had no kids. And he had to wait 24 years for the fulfillment of that promise. He waited all of his life for the place of promise, the promised land. But that wasn't really going to be given to him. That was given to his heirs. But nonetheless, he continued to wait. Now, there was a couple times in the scriptures where he didn't wait, and they weren't good things. He, he was promised the son, and because of his impatience, he produced an Ishmael. This was an act of the flesh between him, his wife, and his wife's maidservant that they tried to make the promises of God come to pass, and they failed miserably. And then there was another time when God told him to go into the promised land and wait there because of a lack of faith. What did he do? He went to Egypt. And again, it just wasn't a good thing. When it comes to how long does faith wait, the answer is really easy. Maybe not desirable, but it's really easy just as long as that is necessary, at least in the sight of God. And so what is it that you're waiting for? Where is it that you're waiting? As long as you're waiting in the place that God has called you to wait, that's a good place. To continue to wait on the Lord. To wait on the Lord, now keep in mind, to wait on the Lord is an active wait. We wait in service, we wait in the word, and we wait in fellowship. And God will reveal himself to us. In the book of Acts, we've got the perfect picture. I'm just going to go through this quickly. Most of you have heard it before. Face it, most of you have heard everything that I've ever had to say before. <laughs> hey, you're still coming, so you still must want to hear it. In Acts chapter 13, you've got the Apostle Paul. Now, this is a wait, because we know what Paul was called to do, and this is before he was, not before he was called, but before he went out on his missionary journeys. It says, now in the church that was in Antioch, Antioch that's in Lebanon, it's in the northern part of Israel, really outside the boundaries of Israel, but this was the jumping off point to the Mediterranean as the missionaries would go out. And so he was in the local church. He was going to church. There were certain prophets and teachers, and he lists a list of men there. And so these were people, since they were prophets and teachers, these were people who were exercising their spiritual giftings within the local church. Now we see in these names, and I'll read them in a minute, we see in these names that these were people who were going to have greater callings than this, 
but nonetheless they were doing what they needed to do or they knew to do at the time. There were Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul would be the Apostle Paul. It says in verse 2, And they ministered to the Lord. So they were busy within that church. And they fasted. And fasted, that would always tell me that they also prayed. And it was in the midst of that waiting that the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for, to the work, for the work to which I have called them. And so Paul wasn't just sitting around with his feet up on the couch, just, I'm waiting on the Lord. It was a very active wait. He was busily waiting for what God had for him. David, King David, waited on the Lord. And as he waited on the Lord, he came to an understanding. As we wait on the Lord, God hears us. And it was kind of an amazing concept to him. In Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, what follows is the result of him patiently waiting on the Lord. It says, and he inclined to me. He gave his attention to me. He heard my cry. He hears our prayers. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon the rock. He put me in a stable place and established my steps. Again, that first step, but every other step. He has put a new song in my mouth. Remember what a new song is? When you see in the Bible that term, a new song, that means a fresh awareness of the grace of God. He realizes he doesn't deserve any of this, but his God is gracious. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in, the God, in God. Because God has worked in me in this manner, people are going to be able to see just me. Just this humble man with there's nothing to be valued in it, but to see this mighty God who has worked in it and understand that just as surely as he has worked in my life, he would be able to work in their lives as well. David was, was very, very dedicated to the Lord, but David was not a perfect man. But as all that shows us is, is the good grace of God and how faithful he is. In Isaiah 40, 31, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Again, verse 10. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Good news. It's built. It's built. Better news it's being custom fit just for you. That place that you have up in the heavens. This isn't what it's all about. This isn't what God has for us. It's just part, well, I shouldn't say isn't, but it's just part, a small part of what God has for us. If you truly believe in God and you truly believe in heaven, what are you holding on to down here? I know that your affections are set here. There's no doubt about it. My wife's here. My kids are here. My grandkids are here. And if the Lord wills, I'll have some grand, great grandkids that are, that are here. But ultimately, the prize is heaven. It's why we take that first step. It's why we faithfully move forward, holding fast to faith in this journey, is because I recognize, we need to recognize that final destination. And then thirdly, there is the result of faith, verses 11 through 16. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. See, that means that she couldn't conceive seed. She was an old lady. And, and you see, when it says that Abraham was as good as dead, that means that he was an old man, so neither of them was really able to produce a child, do the process to produce a child. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, do you remember when she heard the promise that Sarah's going to be with child? What did she do? <laughs> I, I, I did that to my wife. I said something about, you know, she was saying she wasn't feeling well one morning or something. I said, well, maybe you're pregnant. She didn't laugh. She told me I'd be finding a new place to live if she was pregnant. I told her if she's pregnant, I'm going to go find a new place to live. <laughs> But that's, you know, it was a laugh, it was a laugh of disobedience, maybe a laugh, a laugh of a lack of faith. But I think it was also a laugh of, if only it's true. I think there was an element of faith. And that's all God looks for, is just, just a little seed of faith. Just a mustard seed of faith. And he's told us he'll do great things if we just have that mustard seed 
of faith. He's not looking for perfection from any one of us. He's just looking that we would seek him for his direction and again, follow through. Verse 12, Therefore, because of this, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Not just speaking of Israel, but we're told back in Galatians and in the book of Romans that his descendants are those who would trust in God through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. So just as Abraham exhibited faith, and what does it say? It was accounted to him for righteousness. That's basically what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, by grace you have been saved through faith means. Because as I exhibited faith, grace flows through that conduit of faith. And because of that, righteousness is accounted to us. What does it mean to be accounted to us? That means righteousness is put in my bank account. I have it, I own it, I just don't possess it. And what I mean by that is I'm not completely righteous in that I stumble, I fall, I fail. But God, when he looks at me, he chooses to look at me as he looks at his son, Jesus Christ. By grace, you've been saved through faith. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, was assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. And so these were future promises that, how did these things become accounted to them? Because they believed. They believed. That's the only reason why anybody ever exercised faith, is because you, you believe. And because they believed of these things, and keep in mind that's believing without seeing, then God blessed them. Verse 14, for those who say such such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. The idea was, when they left, that was in their rear mirror. The old life, that that was past. Remember, if you hold on to faith, you're walking strongly with the Lord. But if you're slipping away or if you're going backwards, it's not a good thing. And and so once they left the old land, the old land was gone. It says in verse 16, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Isn't that a, a powerful, very powerful verse? God is not ashamed to be called their God, just simply because they responded in faith. Look at every rotten thing that you've ever done. Look at every sin that you have ever committed. Look at every way that you have ever been disobedient to God, and as long as you exhibit faith in God, he's not ashamed to call you his child. I've never been ashamed of any of my... I haven't been happy with my kids a lot, but I've never been ashamed of them because they're my children. Never been ashamed of one of my grandchildren because they're my children. And God feels the same way towards you. You're children of God through faith in Jesus Christ, and that is a strong... That is a powerful, most powerful thing that we truly need to embrace. Remember, I say remember, we studied the book of Exodus probably about 18 years ago. But in Exodus chapter 26, we're given this description of the tabernacle. There was four coverings of skins over the tabernacle, well, really materials. There was linen, there was goat hair, there was ram skins and badger skins. Linen, well, that was the beautiful part. That was the place that when you were inside, you would see it had all the tapestry upon it. And linen, the white linen, it represented the righteousness of God. You had colors in it of blue that, that, that spoke of the, the heavens, the dwelling place of God. Purple that spoke of the majesty of God. And scarlet, we know that that pointed towards the sacrificial death of God. Then after that, they would put goat's hair. That was black probably represented God dwelling in the midst of sinners. Then after that was ram skins. It was probably the symbol of a future provision of the Lord for the sins of the world. It was a ram that was caught in the thicket after the angel delivered um, uh, Isaac from Abraham, from him sacrificing him. And again, they found that, that ram in the thicket. And then badger skins were on the outside. Badger skins were just plain and ordinary. So again, We're told in the scriptures, we saw it when we were studying um, the book of Numbers, if somebody was on a hill looking at the children of Israel as they were wandering through the wilderness, if you were able to look and see the whole thing, you, you would see this tabernacle in the middle. 
and, and you would see light coming out from the crevices if in fact there were. I mean, the glory of God inhabited it. And then you would see the layout of the people. And the layout of the people, if you look how it's laid out by tribes and the size of the tribes, if you were standing at the foot of it, it would be a cross. It, 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 would, just, it would just perfectly just be a picture of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ with the presence of God in the middle. But again, if you were unaware of these things are foolishness to the natural man, if you went and you looked, you would think, I've heard of their God and how he's delivered these people from Israel and how, you know, regardless of their failings, they did take a step of faith out into that wilderness and I've come to see this amazing God and there's that gray blob that's in the middle of it. What's the big deal here? Well, you're never going to know what the big deal is. Nobody's ever going to know what the big deal is until you enter in. Because the presence of God is in that tabernacle. Now, he's everywhere, but that's where his glory was. And you wouldn't see the beauty of that. You wouldn't be able to see the gold and the silver and the bronze and all of the tapestries and all of that stuff until you entered in. And it's the same thing with Christianity. You don't get to see the beauty of Christianity until you enter in. There's no trial periods here. There's no 30 days, get your money back if you don't like it. You just have to fully enter in and give of yourself. You have to take that step of faith. And, but then it extends to other places in our Christian lives as well. As far as service, what's the beauty of serving God? And I don't understand that. You're just getting free labor for the children's or whatever it might be. You're never going to understand until you enter in. You just don't get to see the beauty until you enter in. Heaven, I can only imagine, as the song goes, but I'll never really understand until I enter in. Isaiah 53, 2, For he shall grow up before him, speaking of the future Messiah, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So the same thing as a tabernacle, no outward beauty. I don't understand, I don't know the beauty of the Lord until I enter in to that relationship. That's why the world looks and goes, you're going to church again? And you, you, oh, you're one of those Christians? They're not going to understand because they've never entered in. From the outside, it all looks very plain. To see the beauty, you need to enter in. To see the beauty of salvation, you have to enter in. To see the beauty of God's family, you have to enter in. To see the beauty of faith, you must enter in, go forth, and hold fast. It's the only way you're ever going to know. It's the only way that you'll ever see. Father, once again, we just thank you, God, that you have given us your word. And I just pray, Father, that the things that we see here that are contained, that, Lord, we would grasp onto them just as our forefathers had grasped onto them through faith. And, Lord, this is going without knowing, and it's going without understanding. But, Lord, above all, it's going knowing that you are directing our steps. The steps of a righteous man, the Bible tells us, are directed by the Lord. And again, that's the first step, and that's every step thereafter. Father, I just pray that every person here would, would digest these things and make them real and applicable to their lives. I pray, Father, if there's anybody here that maybe is failing in any area, maybe you've heard the, the voice of God calling you or telling you or whatever it might be, God is a God who allows us to repent and to move forward. May we, Lord, just simply hold fast for all we're worth to faith. And that, Lord, even as our Christian life started with it, they'll end with it as well. But, Father, I pray that we would possess it every step of the way. Slipping away? Slipping away is easy. Regression is always easy. It takes no effort whatsoever. Father, I pray that we would exhibit that effort, that we would extend that effort to our Christian lives, that we would be well-pleasing to you. So once again, Father, we just thank you, God, that you have given us this morning. I pray again, Lord, that you would drive this word deep within our souls, that we would be of the mindset not only just to hear it, but also to do it. And as we do it, Father, I pray that we would glorify you in all that we do. We have such this great opportunity to enter into the family of God through faith, but to take those steps, Lord, into serving you, to take the step into sharing our faith with others, to take the step in living a holy Christian life, enable us to do these things that you have called us to do, that you would be glorified through our humble lives, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you all stand, please?
Okay, we have the women's tea tickets on sale for everybody except for Christine. Actually, Christine still has to buy one. And Joanne. Everybody else.